Now it's time for Zodiac Killer Files by Michael Butterfield. Okay, we're back and joining us now, of course, is our contributor for um, crime in Zodiac. It's Michael Butterfield. How are you doing today? All right, how are you? Oh, not bad, not bad. Um, so, so tell us. <laughs> the Bay Area killer was caught, and uh, they used a DNA system. And they yeah. went through tw- what they went through twenty three and me, and then they went to um, ancestry dot com. Uh, do you think that's going to be a legal process that they use, and they're going to use it for Zodiac and several other killers they can try? Well, the the process they used was a, a slightly complicated. Um, there could be some legal issues that come up with it. Websites like ancestry dot com and twenty three and me. Uh, require a court order for law enforcement to use their databases. And in the Golden State Killer, I'm not really sure how much they use those databases, although I heard that there was a uh, court order issued in one instance for a DNA database, although I'm not sure it's one of those. But then the information they were seeking turned out to not be what they were hoping. Um, Largely, in the Golden State Killer case, they used an ancestry database called GEDmatch, uh, which is spelled G-E-D, match. Um, that has a much smaller sampling than Ancestry.com and 23andMe, which, I, if I remember correctly, those databases contain approximately 10 million uh, genetic profiles. GEDmatch contains approximately 960,000 profiles. And that database does not require a court order and uh, is available to law enforcement and also has uh, lesser standards for the DNA sample. So with the Golden State Killer, if you don't mind, we'll just real quick explain to the audience how they uh, use that. Um, They had a DNA sample taken from semen found at a crime scene, uh, a murder scene in 1980, I believe. And the coroner who worked on those cases did something that most coroners didn't do at the time, which is he insisted that they make duplicate rape kits. So years later, when uh, Paul Holes, the Contra Costa County investigator who was involved in this, um, when he went to get DNA for that case, the sample had been perfectly preserved all of this time. It had never been opened or used. And they were able to take that sample form a genetic profile, and then Paul Holes updated that profile into the GEDmatch database. And in that database, they were able to find three, I think it was two or three distant relatives of the killer, what was described as uh, second or third cousins. And after they identified those individuals, they were able to trace those individuals back to a common ancestor who I believe was the great, great, great grandparents. From there, they had to assemble a uh, 23 family trees to account for all of the descendants of those great, great, great grandparents. And then after they had assembled those family trees, they had to search through those family trees to find men who matched the the Golden State Killer criteria, the the right age, the right physical description, the right background, and the right geographical background, meaning they were in the California area at the time. And I believe they narrowed that down to five individuals. And of those five, there was only one who had an interesting profile, and that turned out to be Joseph James D'Angelo. But they still had a lot of work to do. Then they had to follow this individual around until he discarded something that had his DNA on it. And I believe it was touch DNA in the first instance. They retrieved something he had dropped in a public space, tested it. It matched the Golden State Killer's DNA. Then they had to do that process again to confirm. So they waited until he dropped something else. They tested that. Once they had that confirmation, then they had to actually... Uh, go out and get a search warrant. They had to search his home. They had to get samples of his DNA and then actually test those samples to confirm. And then that would be the evidence that would be used against him in court. Now, in this instance, 
it doesn't appear that there's going to be any legal recourse for Joseph D'Angelo to appeal this because the ancestry databases really didn't play a part in identifying him in particular. The database identified some of his relatives, and then it was good old-fashioned detective work, scouring through public records, birth records, death records, social security records, all that kind of stuff, to do the rest of the work to track down the actual uh, five individuals and then help track down Joseph D'Angelo. Um, so that process was very complex. I think a lot of people think that law enforcement just went to a database and checked for his DNA, found him, and then drove straight to his house and arrested him. And that's, that's not what happened. It's much more complicated. And while there could be some legal issues involved, um, those would largely be adjudicated in court beforehand you know, getting a court order to use the databases. Now, in the Zodiac case, we're talking about a different process because in the Golden State Killer case, you're talking about a, a substantial uh, DNA sample that came from semen left behind at the crime scene by the killer. In the Zodiac case, we're talking about samples of saliva, which would be found on the stamps and envelopes sent by the killer. So we've already in the past had difficulty obtaining substantial DNA from those communications. In the past, law enforcement was able to find a partial DNA profile, and that partial profile was sufficient to exclude suspects, but it could never be used to positively identify anyone. So now there's a renewed effort to find DNA on some of the Zodiac letters and other items in other uh aspects of the case that might provide some DNA. And the process that they would use would be similar to the process used in the Golden State Killer case, but it would have to differ in several ways, especially if they were unable to find a complete sample. And then that would be extremely difficult to use the forensic genealogy. Well, I, I just wonder, but... Um because I've heard I've heard uh, feedback about there being a challenge against it because they had no right to go through and find out someone else's information with someone else's DNA. That's now, been raised, yes. But with um, GEDmatch, if I remember correctly, with GEDmatch, their rules specify that your information can be shared with other people. Um, it's with Ancestry.com and 23andMe, which has much more rigid guidelines and rules. Um, but then again, the evidence used in the D'Angelo case didn't come from those two sites. It came from GEDmatch, as, as far as I can understand. Um, but there could be some legal issues involved. The problem is, is whether or not, uh, you know, those issues might be adjudicated by lawyers and by activists and privacy activists and things like that. But as far as uh, Joseph D'Angelo, I don't think it's going to help him much. <laughs> you know, I don't think his lawyers are going to get much traction out of that in the court of law. Um, now, with Zodiac, do we actually have any DNA that we could use? That's a point of contention. You know, the DNA that they had discovered before has been questioned for various reasons, but... Um, there have been many attempts to get DNA from Zodiac evidence over the years. As far as we know, the first efforts took place in the late 1990s when the San Francisco Police Department tried to retrieve DNA from stamps and envelopes used by the Zodiac. And from reports, they did find some DNA. That DNA was tested against various suspects and did not match, including the main suspect, Arthur Lee Allen. But we're not really sure what letter or communication that came from. We're not really sure uh, how substantial the DNA profile was because there hasn't been any information released uh, officially to the public. Um, a few years later, in uh, 2002, I believe, the San Francisco Police Department did some renewed testing in cooperation with the television show, and they examined... Letters sent by the Zodiac, in particular some letters sent by the Zodiac in, I believe, November of 1969. And they retrieved some DNA from a stamp. And the 
or, or an, stamp or an envelope. I can't remember which, excuse me. Um, but that was the partial profile that was not sufficient to definitively identify anyone. In the few years after that, the um, Vallejo Police Department apparently made another attempt to get some DNA off of some of the early Zodiac letters, and there was some reports that there was a partial profile found there that did not match Arthur Lee Allen. And then there was also some efforts to get DNA from uh, a blanket used at one of the crime scenes. Um, and there was some DNA found in that, but from what we understand, it's a mixture of DNA, meaning it's more than one individual. And at this time, they're not able to separate it. It's very possible that it could be the mixture of the male and uh, female victims in that case. Or if the killer had cut himself, there could be something there. But basically, for your audience, you know, there are, there are four main Zodiac crimes. The first shootings on Lake Herman Road, which occurred in December of 1968. It was a young couple that were shot to death there. There's nothing in that case, uh, which could be used for DNA testing as far as we know. All, the only evidence we have from that crime is uh, comes in the form of bullets and shell casings. Um, and in the Blue Rock Springs case, which is the next murder that happened in July of 1969, it's a similar situation. There's nothing that could be tested for DNA. Um, the Zodiac did use a payphone, but at this time, you know, that no way that, that could be examined for DNA evidence. So the first place that they're really looking for DNA now, um, at least to the Vallejo Police Department, comes from the first three letters sent by the killer in July of 1969. These were three virtually identical handwritten letters that took uh, credit for the two murders or the two attacks. And, uh, listed details that the writer said would be known only to the police and the killer. They are trying to get DNA from those stamps and envelopes. There's also another letter that was sent shortly after that. That was the first letter that used the name Zodiac. The first three letters, the writer referred to himself as the murderer. The next letter that came in August of 1969 provided more details about the murders and used the name Zodiac for the first time. Um, so those are items that will be looked at. Um, then there's also the next crime at Lake Berryessa, the stabbing at Lake Berryessa, where the Zodiac wore a hooded costume. And he wore gloves, uh, he stabbed the victims, he held them at gunpoint and then tied them up and then stabbed them. Um, there's some evidence there. There's, like I said, this, this blanket. There's a green uh, glass bottle that was found at the crime scene that, there's some speculation it might have been handled or used by the killer, and that's been kept in evidence all these years. And then there's also uh, the car door. The Zodiac left a handwritten message on the car door of one of the victims that day. And there have been attempts to find DNA on that door. There have been attempts to find fingerprints on that door, although to the best of my knowledge, they have been unsuccessful. Um, Years ago, I did a show called Mystery Quest with uh, Paul Holes, the guy who was instrumental in helping to solve the Golden State Killer case. And he talked to us about some of the things that might be done with the evidence that they had in those cases. And one of the things that he was interested in were these pre-cut lengths of plastic clothesline the killer used at Lake Berryessa to bind the victims. Uh, Paul Holes said that these were items that came from the killer's home environment, most likely. And so the plastic clothesline was hollow, and he thought it was possible that there could have been at one time some evidence inside those uh, lengths of clothesline that might have some material from his environment that could help him identify him, or that they might be able to get some touch DNA from them because he had handled them maybe in his home before wearing gloves. Um, but I don't know that that's ever been done. Um, the next case is the case in San Francisco in October of 1969 where the Zodiac killed a cab driver. And in that instance, the killer handled the victim and tore off a piece of his clothing and 
To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website www.somethingweirdmedia.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Some areas of the cab that he might have touched, but that's probably... This has been a production of Something Weird Media. There's also some gloves that were found in the cab, and apparently they've made efforts to test the inside of those gloves for DNA. And uh, we're not sure whether those gloves belong to the killer or were left there by someone else. But those are those are the items that are available to us in addition to the rest of the Zodiac letters that were sent from 1969 to 1971 and then the suspected Zodiac letters from 1974. Hmm. But, you know, the um, DNA is getting better and better, so... Uh, it's probably just a matter of time before they can actually um, get the DNA off the letters and things. That's right. The technology has continued to advance. And it's interesting that the more that the evidence degrades over time, the better the technology gets and its ability to sort of retrieve that evidence. And so, you know, before when they were trying to obtain DNA from these stamps and envelopes, they had faced a difficult situation where they might be able to detect the presence of DNA there, but they wouldn't be able to separate it from the glue or the adhesive on the stamps or the envelope. Now the technology exists for them to do that. So that's another step. They're also better at amplifying the DNA that they do find, because basically what they do is they find DNA and then they amplify it several times or many times until it becomes much more of a visible pattern. And so in this instance, it's been, what, you know, 16 years since the last time they did any thorough DNA testing, at least that we know in public. The last time they could only get a partial profile from a stamp, but now they might be able to get a full profile. But then that raises other issues because several factors have to fall into place for DNA to lead to the arrest or identification of the Zodiac. In the Golden State Killer case, they were able to find this person through the help of forensic genealogy, but then it took a lot of regular detective work. In the Zodiac case, if they are fortunate enough to find a complete DNA profile, then they go to an ancestry database like GEDmatch. Hopefully, there will be in that database the DNA of someone related to the killer, because if there isn't, then that avenue is not going to work. If they do find some distant relatives and they are able to track down uh, their descendants and living relatives and anybody who might fit the Zodiac's uh, profile, then you have to hope that that person's alive. If that person died however long ago and was cremated or whatever, Um, we might not be able to get their DNA. And that would prevent us from definitively solving the case. Because in the Golden State Killer case, even though they had the suspect's DNA, and even though they found some uh, matches to the family in the database, they still had to track down the individual and get his DNA to, to test it. So if the Zodiac died and was cremated, it might be difficult to find his DNA. And in that instance, you'd be forced to turn to his living relatives And who knows, they might not be willing to cooperate, especially if they're worried that the DNA they provide could be used to prove that someone in their family was one of the most notorious serial killers in American history. So it's a a double-edged sword. The new technology could do a lot to uh, finally get the evidence that we need, but then you have to have all these other factors fall into place for that evidence to do what it needs to do to help us solve the case. Well, you never know, too. Uh, They could always sit outside of the house and take garbage to get the DNA. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. With with Joseph D'Angelo, they followed him around and waited for him to drop something. And with Zodiac, you know, if they, don't get me wrong, I, if they find a DNA sample, I'm sure that they will do whatever they can to make the most of it. And if they do find any information in any of these databases, I'm sure that they will do whatever is necessary to track it down. And if they reach the point where they're looking at a dead suspect and they can't get his DNA, I'm sure that they will do whatever is possible to get the answers that are available. Um, 
at, at a certain point, you kind of cross a threshold. So once you've started to look into a specific family, once you find any kind of a match, a familial DNA match to a specific family or, or family lineage, then you, you're you're on the right track. You're very close. So, you know, we might not be able to get the person's DNA, but police might be able to gather enough information that would make them think that the person is most likely the Zodiac because this raises the other issue, which is with Joseph D'Angelo, his uh, DNA was left at a murder scene. There's no question that the individual who left that DNA was the person who committed the murder. In the Zodiac case, you could have a clever uh, suspect or, or defense attorney try to argue in court that, yes, I did lick the Zodiac envelopes or, or stamps, but I didn't commit the murders. I only licked those envelopes for someone else. Um, and then, you know, of course, that person would hopefully name whoever that is in order to get out of it. But it does raise an issue about the chain of evidence and whether or not whoever wrote the letters was directly responsible for the crimes. Now, I believe that's the case, but that is an issue that could come up and they might have some difficulty uh, getting around that. But no matter what happens, just like with the Golden State Killer case, um, the DNA is not going to be all that they're going to look for. Once, once they identify a suspect who they think is the killer, they're going to try to get his DNA, but they're also going to try to get samples of his handwriting. They're going to try to find contemporaneous photographs of him and do everything they can to gather other evidence to prove that he was the killer because there's suspected Zodiac fingerprints, there's handwriting, there's palm prints on a, on a car, uh, on a car door. There's, there's or a palm print on a, a phone booth, palm print on a suspected Zodiac letter. Um, so they're going to try to find as much information as they can, and the DNA is only going to be a part of that. Well, and and there's no guarantee that that DNA is uh, the Zodiac either on any of that. That's right. Now, there is a, a story that's been going around that the genetic profile that they had obtained 16 years ago was somehow invalid or unreliable because they had apparently – and this is, again, unconfirmed, but apparently had found the DNA sample on the front of the stamp and not on the back. And the idea is that because it was found on the front, it could belong to anyone who touched the letters or it could belong to some drooling mailman or something like that. When that's certainly possible, but I think people forget, especially younger people who haven't ever had to lick a stamp in their life. I mean, if you stop to think about it, most people don't do that anymore at all. Um, but when you put a stamp between your fingers and you lick it and then you put it onto an envelope and you press down on it to fix it to the envelope, basically what you're doing is smearing your DNA, or DNA around onto that stamp. Um, so it's perfectly possible that that DNA could belong to the killer. But there's also the possibility that the killer had somebody lick stamps for him or that he had an accomplice or something like that. But I tend to lean towards the idea that the Zodiac was one person who acted alone and that the reason that none of this evidence has ever matched any of the known suspects is because they're not the Zodiac. When we find the Zodiac, I think it's very possible that the evidence that they have will match the Zodiac in some of those instances. And I tend to believe that is his DNA. Yeah, it's kind of, um, so you think it's going to be someone that, uh, has been mentioned or a book written about or uh, someone's accused of being the actual killer or do you think it'll be someone different that we don't don't even know i tend to lean towards the idea that it's going to be someone we've never heard of before and that's that's based on several points the first is that the known zodiac suspects the people who've been named like arthur lee allen and people like that um there, people have spent years, decades, investigating them and have never been able to produce any credible evidence linking them to the crimes whatsoever. Their fingerprints don't match. Handwriting experts have concluded that their handwriting doesn't match. Um, in some instances, like Arthur Lee Allen, he doesn't match the physical description provided by witnesses. And one of the police officers who saw the Zodiac at the last known murder um, stated very clearly that Arthur Lee Allen couldn't be the person that he saw. 
So if he was correct and that evidence is valid, then I would be very surprised if it turned out to be Arthur Lee Allen because every single time they find some evidence, whether it's DNA on a letter or a palm print on a letter or a fingerprint at a crime scene or handwriting or eyewitness descriptions and things like that, it never matches Arthur Lee Allen. And his accusers apparently think that's proof that he's a master criminal, that he's some sort of genius. But I think it leans towards the idea that it's just not him. The same thing is with these other suspects. You know, they've been checked with handwriting and other evidence, and nothing's ever come up to indicate they were involved. So I think that I would be very surprised if it turned out to be someone like Arthur Lee Allen. But... I don't care who the Zodiac turns out to be as long as he's identified and especially if he's arrested and in prison. So if it turned out to be Arthur Lee Allen, that would be a great day. I There wouldn't be a single part of me that would be disappointed to hear that it was him because then the case would be over. Um, I think we're much more likely to find out that it was someone that we've never heard of before, largely because if the Zodiac didn't know his victims and there's no evidence that he did know his victims, and there's no evidence that he's connected to them in any other way, um, then traditional means of investigation are not going to identify the Zodiac Killer because how are you going to find him in the first place? So I tend to think that he's never been on the radar of police, that he's never been identified. And when you look at other major cases, it's not unusual. You know, Joseph D'Angelo was never a suspect in the Golden State Killer crimes. Never, not even once. Um, Dennis Rader, the BTK strangler who was captured after 25 years, uh, he had never been a suspect at any time. Now, there are other cases, like the Green River Killer, where the guy who turned out to be the killer was somebody that had been a suspect for a long time. But in that instance, the avenue that led them to suspects was a, a natural progression of investigation. It's a man who's murdering women who work as prostitutes, so you investigate men who solicit prostitutes. You have a, a natural, easy in to look for the killer because you know you, there's a pool of people and you know he's probably in there. With the Zodiac, that's not the same. There was no sexual component to the crimes, no traditional discernible motive like robbery or revenge or anything like that. So the suspect most likely never surfaced, and because of that, he's probably going to turn out to be someone that we've never heard of before, and he's probably going to turn out to be somebody who surprises us in many ways about what we thought about the Zodiac. Yeah, I think that'll be good, um, because it'll stop all of these books and theories that keep, keep coming out, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, there'd be a lot of people who are going to have some uh, splaining to do <laughs> so it gets uh, identified. Now, like I said, I, I try not to get my hopes up because I don't want to be disappointed, but this is very exciting. Um, the idea that new technology can be used and might find the DNA of the killer and that that DNA could lead to his identification, that's an amazing thing. And I, I don't want to sound pessimistic about it. I'm just trying to be realistic about it. But... At the same time, you know, I would love to wake up to news that the Zodiac had been identified. It would be it would be an amazing thing. But if that did happen, yeah, there's going to be some people who are going to have some egg on their face who've been running around claiming that they've solved the case for a long time and accusing various people. And when that happens, they're going to be faced with a choice of accepting what's happened or some of them are probably going to try to fight it because, you know, What's happened before is that when a suspect was cleared through DNA, suddenly people start saying that the police are corrupt or incompetent and didn't handle the DNA properly or didn't investigate properly. So they always try to find some way around it, and I wouldn't be surprised if that happens if they do identify the killer. Uh, yeah, especially some of them have um, developed theories that, you know, there's really no evidence, and they put up, you know, they create these... Um, connections through just the most bizarre means and it's just it's just that there's you know it's the old story if it could be anything you know i could be a runway model you know <laughs> well i think also too that you know like i was we were discussing this earlier because I, as i was saying to you in our private conversation 
Al, you know, if this DNA research does advance the way that it does, you're, you're going to have to prepare yourself for the possibility that the DNA is going to prove that the Zodiac was not Ted Cruz. Um, oh. it's, it's probably coming, so you need to prepare yourself. I'm taking that to my grave. <laughs> but like I said to you also, the fact that Ted Cruz was not alive during the first Zodiac murders would normally be a rock-solid alibi. But in today's atmosphere of the very people that you're talking about, um, it doesn't seem to deter people. So you have a lot of people who are accusing suspects without any credible evidence whatsoever, and they're getting a lot of media attention. You know, some of them are having TV docu miniseries made out of their claims, even though there's nothing to them in the first place. And I don't think they're going to be deterred by the negative results of DNA. Cause if DNA identifies somebody other than their suspect as the Zodiac, um, I don't think they're going to accept that unless it's, you know, incontrovertible and the guy confesses and says, I did it all by myself, you know, and that kind of thing. But in other circumstances where let's say, let's say they find a complete Zodiac profile, but it doesn't help them identify the killer, then that profile would be used to clear suspects. And some of these people who their suspect would be cleared, I doubt very seriously that they would accept it. They would just continue to say that the DNA is, uh, corrupted or the police department is corrupt. Yeah, I, yeah, that's that's the problem right now. That um, I mean, I could because I could come back and say, well, um, you know, you you say that um, it's not Ted Cruz, but I can say that um, he was he wasn't born when they say he was. It was a cover up. <laughs> show show me right. his birth certificate. That's right. You know, I mean, I because mean, nowadays people just they their fact is feeling right. So because they feel a certain way and, you know, they think a certain way, it, you don't need to have physical evidence because too many people do their research on the Internet and that's all they do. They, oh, yeah. they, you know, that's why, you know, when people say things about these shooters and different things going on and you hear the news stories, there's there's um, but they're not out in the field. Like the Vegas shooter, if if you're not in Vegas and you're not working the scene and you're not like a journalist reporter working there, uh, everything you get is 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 hearsay and second hand. Um, it's not it's not tangible. You you have to be there, talk to people, see it, be part of it, collect the evidence, and that that's what's missing nowadays. Oh yeah, well, and I think that it's interesting that you brought up the. The idea about Ted Cruz that, you know, people would say he his his date of birth has been manipulated or something and he really is the Zodiac. You know, we say that kind of jokingly, but that is kind of where things are with this case right now. People have these pet suspects and theories that they're not going to let go of no matter what. And the fact that someone wasn't alive at the time is not going to deter them. Um, I think <laughs> it, it is very interesting, though, that a lot of these people who are getting this uh, major media attention with these very flimsy theories, unlike uh, the way things played out in the past, they don't seem to be getting a lot of traction anymore. There used to be a, 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 a sort of built-in period of time these people got a freebie on this, and now that seems to have eroded a little bit, and now they're having their 15 minutes of fame, but it's it's not lasting as long as it used to, and I think people are a little more aware and attuned to the fact that it's probably not valid. I think a lot of people don't care. Yeah. I, I think that the thing is, it, it you know, all these shows coming up on crime now, on Reels and Paramount and, you know, it's endless oxygen and, and they're, they're doing all these little shows and, and it's, it's just nobody cares. You know, I've had people run up and say, oh, did you see that on, on Paramount, the one about, you know, Edward? Wayne Edwards being everyone's killer yeah. and they just kind of go, isn't that cool? You know, it's like, yeah, you know, and then something else comes on. It's just kind of the flavor of the day. Nobody, uh, they're, they're not really watching it and going, Oh my God. And, and taking it serious and following through. It's just the latest little flash. So, yeah, and there's also a saturation of true crime stuff right now too. So I think people are a little overloaded with it and it's not having the impact it used to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been another interesting conversation, and um, we've, we always enjoy talking to you. And uh, we'll be we'll come back again and uh, 
talk more Zodiac. Maybe next time we'll have have the suspect. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Well, again, thanks very much, uh, Mike Butterfield. Thanks for having me. To find out more about our show, guests, or listen to a previous show, visit our website at www.somethingweirdmedia.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.